Fronda at Nurse Docker on Twitter, and you are Greg Glory, AK Social Greg on Twitter uh, for the Nurse Docker Media Network. Anyway, hey man, how's your week going? It's going good, going good. It would go even better if all of you gave to our Patreon. That is patreon.com forward slash nerdstalker. We would love your support and uh, anything you can provide in these trial, uh, tough times right now. We greatly appreciate that. Absolutely. Please, please support my friend Adolfo and yeah. us. I appreciate that. Anyway, let's, ready to get into this? Let's do this, man. Minecraft Dungeons. What, what's going That's on there, right. man? Yeah, so thanks to CNET and Dan Ackerman for this. Minecraft Dungeons is the low-stress family hackathon we need right now. Reasonably kid-friendly, mostly cooperative, and therapeutic as hell. What, could, what more could you ask for from a four-player dungeon crawler? So it's one of those uh, parenting moments where you have to make the tough call. Uh, he says, I'm playing Diablo 3 on my big screen via Nintendo, and a uh, third grader wanders over, and basically, you know, it's super gory and probably not really kid-appropriate. Sure, we should all be playing peaceful games like Flower and Journey, but sometimes you just want to whack a bunch of things with a giant sword or an axe. Uh, trust me, kids feel the same way. That's why Minecraft Dungeons from Microsoft's Mojang Studios, that's a mouthful, is such a perfect game for our currently tense, locked-inside lifestyle. It combines the instant gratification of four-player sword swinging with all ages playfulness of the Minecraft universe already across generational marketing phenomenon bar none. If Minecraft, if Minecraft story mode recasts the building sandbox as a talky puzzle-solving exercise, Dungeon is the complete opposite. A largely wordless journey across mob-filled lands, save for some occasional disembodied narration, where button mashing is the first and only survival skill to master. The biggest selling point of Minecraft Dungeons, available on Windows, Xbox One, PlayStation 4, and Nintendo Switch, is its four-way multiplayer. Uh, that is the same kind of local synchronous gaming for families, roommates, or strangers at a house party. Remember those? are already looking for. Sure, if you can play solo or team up with people online, but the old everyone shares a single screen mode gauntlet style is where the game shines. Uh, there's something lost by stripping Minecraft of its quiet moments of thoughtful terraforming and engineering. The world lacks the most basic level of Minecraft interactivity, the ability to break bricks, to create new pathways and reshape the terrain that makes Minecraft building more like a re reskin of countless other hack and slash games, but it's also forgivable compromise if you're looking for a game for everyone to play together on the same screen at the same time. That won't bore adults or horrify kids. If I want to create a fully functioning city-sized integrated circuit out of basic rocks and minerals down by a lava pit, I've got regular old Minecraft to do that now. Now, I've also got some place to go and bash some monster skulls in an E10 plus way, of course, is what he says. So uh, for you watching now, I'm going to do a little, little screen share so we can see that. Nice. Wow, so this is uh, not MPG, but MFG, multi-family player game. <laughs> yeah. So for the th so for these are listening, it's like uh, it's pretty cute, you know. You see this, and then and then I'm displaying an animated GIF right now where you can see uh, the kids uh, swinging the swords and they're shooting lightning bolts and stuff at each other. It's really cute, um, kind of a tame thing. As you could see, as if you would watching the video right now, it's not as graphic and bloody and everything as uh, some of the other games. So really, sort of appropriate in a Minecraft universe for uh, kids and families and adults, as he as the author mentioned. Uh, so as not to get too bored out of your mind. That's cool. All I mean, right. That's wonderful, actually. Great idea. Yeah, Great cool. idea. So the uh, big story of the week, and uh, I'm glad you posted this one, Greg, that everyone's talking about as of today, anyways, of this recording. Twitter's fact-checking failures reveal serious shortcomings. Yeah, well, you know, I, I think everyone's been talking about, you know, the 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 the, the appended tweet from the president that twitter said yeah. you know look at your fact check right and, and, and this guy kind of had a different take on this and i kind of wanted to have a discussion with you adolfo about this is this, this yeah. is from uh, rob williams uh contributing editor of uh, publishing insider at the media post so uh he says that social media companies like facebook and twitter weren't originally set up to check factual accuracy of what they publish unlike journalism organizations 
Um, instead, social media sites have wanted protections in the Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act that says they can't be held liable for what other people say on their platforms. So Twitter's decision this week to tag one of President Trump's tweets and fact check label with while letting him smear of while well, his smear of MSNBC's Joe Scarborough go unchecked is remarkably mm. inconsistent, he says. If social media sites are going to take more active roles in pol policing speech, they need to be more transparent about how the policies work, he says. Twitter this week marked two of Trump's tweets that claimed mail-in ballots will be mostly fraudulent, an argument that isn't that controversial considering the absentee ballots have been identified in at least one bipartisan study as the biggest source of voter fraud in past elections. Anyone who thinks U.S. postal system is equipped to ensure election integrity is sadly mistaken, he says. And this is an op-ed, so, so you know, I, I read both sides, so uh, whether I believe it or not. Uh, Twitter's label said, get the facts about mail-in ballots and provided a link to CNN column by Chris Saliza that notes, there's no significant evidence of intentional voter fraud on anything near the scale Trump and his allies allege never has been. Um, Saliza supports his claim with links to studies and stories from the same media echo chamber. By citing CNN, Twitter opens itself to additional crit criticism for being lazy about his fact-checking process, outsourcing it to media outlet that re revels in bashing the president. Uh, Twitter backed itself into a quarter by trying to interfere in upcoming election. And then, you know, an interview with uh, Mark Zuckerberg this week from Fox News um, about uh, Twitter's votes, he, uh, you know, Zuckerberg said, I, I just believe strongly that Facebook shouldn't be the arbiter of the truth of everything that people say online, and neither should other private companies. So open up uh, to uh, the, the question, should social media be the fact checker, uh, Adolfo? Yeah, that's it's such a fine line. Well, first of all, it's what an interesting time we live in when the Republican Party is uh, looking to, you know, um, censor business, right? To, <laughs> it's an overreach of government, right? The Republican Party is is known for wanting to reduce government, not to increase it, and for the reach of uh, of Trump wanting to censor, you know, and repeal that effectively. Uh, you know, allow these, these just to impose on business is, is kind of a, kind of a trip, you know, what a we, it's like the upside down I posted in, in uh, another thing. Super weird. Um, but yeah, when it comes to, you know, I'm a big free speech guy. I, you know, I'm very into everyone having the ability to do that. We have to also recognize conversely, these are private companies, as we've stated before, Greg, that, you know, they can kind of do what they want. Uh, although, according to this uh, law change, you know, uh, Trump doesn't want them to, as long as it serve, serves him, obviously. Um, but that gets into dangerous territory. Um, what I'm hoping for is with this sort of the oversteps that we've stated last week in terms of, in my opinion, oversteps of Facebook censoring certain conversations and things like that related, let's say, to COVID, uh, where people are open, uh, who are open to businesses opening like that seem to be getting uh, silenced uh, to some to some extent. I think I'm hoping that other businesses will rise out of that or alternatives, right? Alternatives to YouTube, alternatives to Facebook, alternatives to Twitter. So far that has been largely unsuccessful. I think there've been numerous attempts and numerous small things. So I can see why uh, there is a major concern and they do have such a dominating lead right now and such uh, dominating financial uh, backing and and uh, profiting that, that it's hard for a lot of people and Scott Galloway argues this to, to ever imagine another another company being able to compete with them. He actually calls for some of these companies, and I'm going on a bit of a tangent here, but it kind of relates, uh, for, especially like Facebook and, and uh, Amazon and some some other companies that are sort of related to YouTube, just to be completely broken up, right, into separate companies, similar to what happened to Microsoft and how that, that made everything sort of better. Um, 
But in terms of free speech and censorship, it's tough because there's always that gray area, right? What is and is not pornography has often been sort of a, an argument. And uh, you, at the same time, we don't want to see beheadings on, on YouTube and that kind of thing, right? Uh, but then you get to this this type of thing where it's like political gamesmanship. And that's where you get into this weird gray area. What are you going to do? And uh, that that's a tricky thing because we've seen nation states allegedly hacking, and I'm sure they are, you know, hacking the system to do either destabilize another comfort government or for their own interests, and perhaps that's interrelated. So I don't know. It's yeah, kind of I, like an I don't know. There's a gray area here. Oh, it's, it's, I, nothing's black and white. I mean, this has been the social media debate for the last you know, years, ever since social media really started to really kind of kick in, right? Is that exactly – you know, social media is a, a, a place where you could express yourself, right? Going back to the free speech um, mention that you mentioned earlier, in, you know, mm -hmm. in your comment. Um, you know, the other part of it is another part of it. When you mentioned your comment, also was the capitalistic side of social media. These are private companies. They they earn money through ads and and getting people to kind of talk about things. And so the question is 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 as Twitter moves into this area. I mean, th this writer also said that, like, you know, th he also made a barb against social media. It's not a journalistic company that goes and hires professional journalism that journalists that fact checks things that are put on there, which is totally impossible on a Facebook or a Twitter. You know, even if you got AI running, it to be totally impossible, right? So, so it, it, you know, it would add a delay into the system where you know, you know, before, while you post, you had to wait for the the AI robot to go go figure out if you got all your facts right, right? I mean, that's just not social media, right? And so, I, I yeah, yeah I, I, it made me think about this though more, as you put, as you pointed out, is is really, you know, where do we want to go with all this? Do we really want more uh, government regulation? I think not. Um, you know, can podcasts like ours use, you know, items? and then reposted i mean i just ran into you know like another tangent i just ran into the the mm. the, the copyright ai engine of of youtube right and mm. and, and uh people doing covers of songs right mm. <laughs> you know wow, i'm yeah. allowed i'm allowed to go listen at a bar of a cover to a song without anyone uh, claiming the copyright but once i post it on youtube Oh, the now now the copyright AI engine kicks in, so it, it's. Oh, really? You're in violation then, huh? Yeah, yeah. I mean, Doing it, it basically it's states. Cover of the song. Yeah. So, so this is the crazy wow. thing. Uh, you know, uh, we, you know, I could just say this: that we did the uh, virtual Northern California Cherry Blossom Festival, and we had a couple bands do covers. Well, of then course. the yeah. yeah, that's what they do, right? That's that's what they're in the end. So. They, the uh, YouTube AI engine flagged it as a copyright violation, and it mm -hmm. was very specific. I, yeah, I mean, I'm really shocked now, you know, who are claiming copyrights on these songs, right? And, mm -hmm. like, um, and like, they're even putting hooks in there. You could mute it. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> you right. know, but anyway, going back, it goes back to that censorship thing, right? Is what, yeah, yeah. what, what you know, is available? That's tricky. I, yeah. I ran into sort of a similar but different sort of issue where on Facebook, you know, I posted something that was kind of a, a little bit more pro small business, right? And um, I suddenly lost my rights in a group to comment. And what I realized is that um, people who have a, you know, who've been known or have a different op uh, opinion can flag you, right, willy nilly. And so it's not just the AI, it's also people with uh, varying sort of viewpoints and trolls and, you know, wh whatever it may be, they, they, can, they can sort of flag you you know, um, hashtag Karen, right, to to sort of just like uh, sort of silence you, right? And uh, I don't know. So that's 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 challenging as well. <laughs> so it's it's there are so many different levels to this sort of like silencing and censorship and uh, motivational and how to use that as your angle to the to the whole social media game that it's just uh, perplexing. You know, it's really super confusing. Yeah, totally super perplexing. I mean, I'm glad we talked about it this week because I think it's just um, these are things that are, you know, in front of us as users of these these platforms on a daily basis. You know, you know, we're constantly being monitored and measured, 
right? That's the feeling I'm getting you know, all the time. So, but anyway, uh, it's I something, wonder, you know, I yeah. wonder if it was an overstep though, man, because, um, uh, you, I, I'm, I am kind of worried about, <laughs> even though these companies aren't necessarily worried about us, uh, them being uh, litigated willy nilly as well, right? Into oblivion. I mean, cause they do provide a service. They, they do provide tons of jobs and, uh, I would hate to see any sort of innovation stifled at the same time. So it's a kind of a balancing act in a way. Oh, yeah, I, I, I agree. And I think that, you know, part of it also that's wrapped around all this is the whole law legal tort system, right? I mean, and so I think that's, that also, uh, you know, puts, uh, you know, fears down our spine, right, per se. So anyway, I think, you know, everyone out there could, should think about this as they're posting things to Facebook and, and read things on Facebook or social media to just kind of think about, you know, what they're reading, you know, and, and I think, I, I think if Twitter took the approach of just saying that, like, hey, you know, just, just kind of without adding a link, I thought that would have been fine. You know, but they mm -hmm. they they added the link, so it 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 then went to another source. So I, I I'm not sure if that was the right approach, but that that's my opinion on it. Anyway, anyway, let's move on. Let's move on. What are let's we going next? All right. So yeah. So uh, thanks to CNET Stephen Musley for Musel <laughs> for this uh, post. Uh, Apple reportedly nabs Scorsese film starring DiCaprio and De Niro. Apple will help finance production of Killers of the Flower Moon, which will be distributed by Paramount Variety Reports. So Apple's reportedly bought, uh, brought on board to help produce Martin Scorsese's adaptation of Killer of Flower Moon, an American crime thriller, thriller starring Leonardo DiCaprio and Robert De Niro. Variety reported Wednesday that Apple will finance the picture in partnership with Paramount which will distribute the movie. Uh, it wasn't immediately clear if the movie would be included on Apple streaming service, but you know it will. Apple TV Plus, which has created plenty of original content, but still has some catching up to do against Netflix and Amazon Prime Video. That's an understatement. A deal is expected to be announced in the coming days, Variety reported. The movie is based on 2017 uh, nonfiction book of the same name by American journalist David Gran that investigated a series of murders of wealthy Osage Indians in Oklahoma in the early 1920s. This is the second major movie acquisition Apple has made this month. Apple announced on Monday the 19th that Apple TV Plus will stream Greyhound, a World War II epic starring Tom Hanks about a convoy of ships battling U-boats. Neither Apple nor Paramount immediately responded to requests for comment. I just found this really interesting uh, to to see Apple getting into the well, they kind of already have, but into the you know the entertainment game, the movie game uh, more and more, and, and that seems to be the future, right? The low hanging fruit, and how uh, Hollywood's sort of taking a back step to these tech companies that are coming in, and sort of taking over original content. Uh, that being uh, Amazon, Netflix, and Apple now, and Disney, right, to some extent. Oh yeah, I mean, I think they smell blood with this COVID thing, and you know, basically Hollywood shut down, right? And so, mm -hmm. so now you'll see, you see this. I was talking to a, a filmmaker a friend of mine the other day. It just it's funny you brought this up just just the other day, and we were talking about how, you know, Hollywood's dead right now, mm -hmm. right? And so all these indie makers are now starting to like make moves to try to figure mm -hmm. out how they could play in this area, and and maybe maybe that's where it's rebalancing. It's going to be you know. Uh, more indie studios putting things out and having the opportunity to put those out without having Hollywood involved because um, mm -hmm. they have options like Netflix, like um, Apple. I mean, Netflix has that whole camera thing going, right, where you have to have a certain camera to, to, to yeah, I mean, not exactly, but, you know, if you want to pitch a series to Netflix, then you have to have certain gear that you have to use for, for their Mm, for their series yeah yeah i didn't know if you know mm. that um so yeah they have a whole equipment list so if you don't have the equipment you know and, and we're talking pretty expensive equipment not 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 hella expensive like fifty thousand, but you know you still need right. decent equipment but i, oh, I it, the, the, your story really brings up you know is 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 hollywood dead right i mean is the traditional studios really now um a place where you have to go to do distribution just you know kind of like books and everything right right Interesting. yeah yeah so it's cool yeah because who knows if the uh the theater experience the traditional theater experience will make any type of comeback <laughs> or is it only going to be like streaming and drive-ins you know yeah i mean yeah it's, it's just crazy 
This is crazy. Yeah, but uh, let's see how this all pans out. But I mean, that is a major thing. I mean, is that it's just is just showing that um, other other places to make movies, and it isn't just Hollywood now. So. Anyway. Yeah, I'm interested to see what other tech companies get in this space too, if any. I mean, you need a yeah. big budget, so we'll see. Yeah. Anyway, so what? So what are you asking me this week? What oh, is this? We're ask, gonna be, ask a dolphin segment. So I picked an article. <laughs> um, <laughs> I love doing this. I don't know why. He's such a great uh, guy when he does this. So uh, thanks to Oren Hoffman um, uh, at the Summation Blog. Uh, Summation Blog. He's a, he's an investor and a serial entrepreneur. And I came across this thing called, How Can You Become a 10Xer? And a 10Xer, as they de debate, uh, as they actual uh, define here, is a 10Xer is someone who brings 10 times the value to their company as compared to their peers. Ooh. So, you know, um, I believe uh, Adolfo's a 100Xer. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. No, thank but, you. but we'll go down uh, a Actually, level no, to... 10 Xer, and we'll see exactly who does. So let's let's go through things. So basically, uh, he writes here is um, they impact business most immediately. The organization is improved in a matter of weeks, if not in uh, Dolphin's case, milliseconds, as soon as he <laughs> walks through the door. And and their peers notice very quickly that they found someone special. So anyway, uh, you know, Adolfo has a halo as he comes through the door. Anyway, let's go through. <laughs> Sorry, let's go through the let's go through uh, the, the 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 things. Um, so the first one is see opportunities when others see only threats. The ability to understand and analyze threats is a biz to a business is important. This is especially true of a large, established, multi-billion-dollar enterprise that needs to focus on protecting its downside. So, what do you think about that, man? That's interesting. Yeah, I mean that goes to that whole political quote of. Uh... Uh, don't let a good disaster go to waste, you know what I mean? <laughs> Seeing the positive yeah, think, amongst the negative. Yeah, right? yeah. yeah opportunity, yeah. Cool. And, and we'll, we'll, we'll check that as a box in Adolfo's bag there. Okay, next. Oh, for sure, yeah. <laughs> create a bias for action. So what he mean by this is uh, really smart people are great at pointing out threats, and some are great at finding opportunities. Again, it kind of goes down to the thing. Uh, but... This is just stage zero of being a 10Xer. So um, uh, there are many stages of being a star employee. Um, so I think that uh, one, of the, one of the things is that uh, they understand that a concentrated action may fail, but failure is okay if you learn lessons from it. So um, basically they, they, they said, you know, embracing failure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, there's Take that, that notion of like Kaizen, Kaizen right, yeah. um, where it's uh, uh, constant improvement, right, iterating constantly, yeah. So you're yeah. learning and changing Absolutely. and Absolutely. sifting, filtering to get the good stuff, yeah. And that's on uh, Adolfo's resume, everyone, so, you know, <laughs> his picture shows up when it comes to that. Anyway, that's right, people. Uh, be positive, not negative. Uh, yes, and uh, beats no but. So um, having a negative outlook is often extremely valuable to an organization. People who, have, uh, who are negative can have an incredible accomplishments, and many, many star employees I have worked with have a negative personality. Boy, that's true. Um, but having zero smart people in an organization uh, that are negative can really be dangerous. So true 10Xers yeah. are always glass half full people. It doesn't mean gloss over threats, but because the solution and, and they're Solution and action oriented, they are good at finding solutions to these threats. What do you think about that? I, you know, this reminds me of Ray Dalio. He has a, his company, and he's one of the most successful investors ever. Um, his company culture is one of open critique, right? So I think mm -hmm. it is important to have those type of naysayers in a way so they can poke holes in, in your mindset and give you another viewpoint. Oftentimes, companies look at those people as complainers or whatever, or as negative people, and they're not. Um, they're doing, you know, out of constructive criticism or whatever. But I think you're you're right. If if those people are just doing it to lash out and be mean and aren't the brightest people in the world, obviously that's just, you know, that's that's mean spirited. It's toxic, and and you don't want that. Right, and and in the, and in the agile models that you kind of follow, this open dialogue is very important, right? Oh, super important. Yeah. So then it's the whole going back to uh, uh, psychological safety and trust. Yeah, we have to be open to. Uh, uh, commu communicate openly and yeah have those crucial conversations as they say it's a crucial conversations. it's a main tenet 
Yes. Okay, cool. And then the last but not least, number four here is they make your team better. So 10 actors do great work, but they also make the teams work better. They increase the talent and productivity of those around them to a great degree, making the whole greater than the sum of the pieces. This is one of the reasons why positivity is so important because it can infuse excitement in those around them. You know, that's interesting. I, 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 because I, I, I've seen both sides. I, I wanted to see what you thought about that. Yeah, I mean, obviously, every, that positivity brings an uplifting sort of spirit, obviously, and and makes people feel better. As as does transparency. It, it's one of the things I didn't hear there. I think in which fosters trust and again if you trust people tend to be happy can't tend to get more stuff done because you're sort of flowing together and um, yeah yeah I think uh, positivity is always a wonderful thing you want to work with happy happy ish people or content people at the very least right all right so we have four thumbs up here for and I think that proves to everyone in the world that Adolfo is a 10 that's right so hire me now everyone. hire me now Hey, okay, let's go to speed round. Speed round. <laughs> All right, so uh, thanks to CNET for this story, Abir al Hiti. Uh, funerals in space, the people who send their ashes into orbit. Uh, even in the freezing cold, Stephen Schneider would often drag his wife, Christine, outside to look up at the sky, right? Uh, he'd say, How Do you see it? It's right there. Faintest piece of light going across the sky. Christine, he was really excited about this, the, the sky and all the space stuff. Uh, when Stephen was close to death in 2017, there was a consensus among family members that a space burial would be the best way to send him off. Their daughter took out uh, her phone, did a quick search, and pulled up a company called C Celestis. Last June, a portion of Stephen's ashes, along with the cremated remains from over 150 other Celestis clients, were flown into Earth's orbit aboard SpaceX's Falcon Heavy rocket, which launched from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Another portion of his ashes will be, will fly aboard the Luna O2 mission, which is slated for takeoff in 2022. He'd be so excited about it that he was in space, Christine says. Stephen's family is among a growing number of people looking to space as a final resting place. Companies like Celestis offer a range of experiences from an Earthrise service to uh, that takes someone's ashes into space and brings them back to Earth's orbit and deep space options. Prices run from around 2,500 to 12,500. The average cost of a funeral in the U.S. by, cons by comparison is around $9,000. The service has attracted high profile clients, including Star Trek creator Gene Roddenberry and astronaut Gordon Cooper. Other companies such as Oral Flights, Aura Flights, and Elysium Space offer similar services. Space memorials are becoming increasingly popular thanks to growing cremation rates and a declining emphasis on cultural and religious traditions, says Celestis co-founder and CEO Charles Chafer, who started the company in 1994. The notion of bury me next to my grandfather is in the family plot in a church doesn't work in a mobile society, Chafer says. People look for alternatives. Um, so it's just a really interesting idea that they can be like this sort of secondary payload, right, on, on these spaceships <laughs> and uh, that this is sort of a, a growing trend and, and kind of an interesting thing. You know, I, I myself don't, you know, I, I would I, I would hope that my family and I request that would, you know, uh, cremate me because I don't want to take up space on this earth and all that. But then you hear about, oh, the cremation process is, is like whatever, emitting uh, whatever, you know, stuff. <laughs> Yeah, there's always a trade-off for everything. Win, even a death, huh? Yeah, that's right. Oh, put me in space. Damn. <clears throat> yeah, put you in the ground or put you in space. Speed round. Please, speed round. Speed round. <laughs> okay, well, this this one's been going on for a while, but I, I it, it just kind of bubbled up is that the, uh, thanks for AgriPulse, who's uh, kind of like uh, reporting on the agricultural industry. The USTR takes swipe at EU food name restrictions, and this has been going on for a while, I understand, and it just really hasn't really been on the top of my mind, but it just kind of came up. So, so basically, um, uh, you're, the EU is, 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 is trying to protect food names like Black Forest Han, Feta Cheese, Gorgonzola Cheese, Fontina Cheese, Roquefort Cheese, and Asiago Cheese, uh, claiming that there's a kind of a local... Um, I, I forgot they call it GI, which is really kind of um, there's there's a uh, original restriction to the name to a local area, and only 
only if that it was produced in that local area can you call it by that name essentially and so if if, if u.s cheese manufacturers want to sell gorgonzola cheese made in the united states they have to say gorgonzola like or something like that all, clearly Mm -hmm. on the package and and i just thought it was just hilarious when i was just reading through this because this all these all these things that um you know it goes back to uh, economic protectionism right uh they want to Mm -hmm. they want to make sure that um you know their their names are are protected and i i was hearing some really crazy numbers where where um you know if you had the right name you you could command a higher value price for that product, obviously, right? So, mm-hmm. some, having something like uh, feta like isn't going to command as high a price as feta mm-hmm. cheese. So, anyway, mm, uh, yeah, this, yeah, I know this already exists in in alcohol with like bourbon and whiskey, and uh, champagne has to be from a certain region of France or something like that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there is a precedence for this. Yeah. So anyway, That's silly. Speed round, speed All round. Right. Speed round. <laughs> so thanks to Lifehacker for this one, Lisa Rowan. What to do if you see a COVID-19 surcharge on your receipt? Uh, if you're beginning to venture back out into society to purchase any variety of goods and services, take a look at your receipts. You may have been hit with a surcharge related to the ongoing pandemic. Something listed as a COVID-19 surcharge could uh, be ju- for just about anything. For a hair salon, perhaps the $3 fee went toward the cost of extra cleaning supplies. At restaurants, the surcharges may be used to reflect fluctuating ingredient costs. And while some of the businesses who have implemented these fees upon reopening have explained them via social media, signage, and other efforts, many customers still feel put off by it at all. When it comes down to it, businesses can add on charges for whatever they darn well please. In 46 states, it's legal to charge customers extra just for using a credit card to pay, noted Tim Rossman, industry analyst at creditcards.com. So while a surcharge relating to the pandemic may seem outrageous, it w- it's well within the business's rights. Uh, they've chosen to show you their temporary increased cost of doing business instead of raising prices across the board indefinitely. I've experienced a COVID-19 surcharge as early as late March, said Jen Smith, who blogs at uh, Modern Frugality. Uh, Smith said that if you can, if you see a charge you don't recognize, you should ask about it, you know, politely. And if it doesn't add up, you can share your feelings again politely. Many business owners are scared and making business, business decisions based on fear, she explained. If a surcharge doesn't sit right with you, there's a good chance other customers feel the same way. The proprietor may not even be a fan of the additional surcharge, surcharge but feels it necessary to make ends meet. Freeman said, while you may feel annoyed upon seeing extra fees, keep in mind the businesses are trying to avoid raising prices, so they're charging these fees temporarily. Uh, As we settle further and further into our new normal, you'll probably see some of the surcharges go away. In the meantime, she recommends budgeting for higher prices, especially for food. Um, Smith, on the other hand, said to make sure you keep your eye on your own budget first. People may want to support their local businesses, but you have to prioritize your financial well-being. She said, duh, that may not mean financially supporting businesses as much as you'd like to. Wow, amazing. I didn't realize there were surcharges like that going on. Wow. Ma- the yeah, mass man. charge. The mass charge. Wow. Right. Okay. Speed round. Speed right. round. Speed round. <laughs> Okay, well, um, thanks to Japan Times uh, for this, and uh, uh, Yuri Kageyama from the AP News, uh, she kind of put that in my Twitter feed. So, April travelers to Japan dropped 99.9% from a year earlier to 2,900. So, an estimated 2,900 uh, foreign travelers visited Japan in April, down 99.9% from a year earlier uh, amid the global coronavirus pandemic, according to the latest government data. Um, it's the first time that the monthly figure, which was released Wednesday, has slipped below the 10,000 mark since 1964, when the Japan Tourism Agency began compiling such statistics. <laughs> Holy wow. moly. The, so what the government is looking to do, um, the government is seeking to boost domestic tourism by subsidizing a portion of travel expenses once coronavirus outbreak is brought under control. The one point three five trillion yen which is 12.5 billion program could start in july if novel the novel uh, coronavirus infection subsides soon hiroshi tabata the chief of the agency told the news conference yesterday 
Um, the number of visitors from China, uh, later in the article, fell to 200 in April from 726,132 from a year earlier. And those from South Korea dropped to 300 from 566,624, according to the data. So, um, wow. and, and also uh, Taiwan and the United States that are put in this report. But, hey, look... Look to for the uh, J Japanese government to subsidize your trip to Japan the next time you go there. So anyway, Incredible. thank you. Yeah, wow. is that? Yeah, that's fascinating. Yeah, speed. Oh, I guess tip time now, huh? Tip time. Tip time. Tip time. <laughs> Sigh. <laughs> All right, uh, so thanks to Boing Boing St uh, Tom Dunn for this one. Uh, color your favorite hard rockers with these Kerrang co color coloring books. Uh, if you're looking for more quarantine activities for yourself or your kids or something to do together, the British rock magazine Kerrang is now offering coloring book variants from some of their covers featuring famous rock bands. We've, we've turned seven Kerrang magazine covers plus a bonus My Chemical Romance photo into an elaborate coloring in pages for you to turn into Technicolor ma masterpieces. We've got a Slipknot, Lemmy, Baby, Japan, you know, the Japan baby metal and Ozzy Osbourne and more to choose from. Uh, not only will it give you and your young ones a chance to practice your artistic skills, coloring in is uh, ideal for relieving stress and improving mental health. So for those of you watching, I am going to share my screen because it is so worth it to see these. And for those of you not, um, just use the link on our article and you can see some of these Ooh. here is, uh, yeah, here is, uh, I believe one of these creepy ones right and then here's uh obviously food fighters right and the crank logo behind it and i'm displaying here's baby metal, baby metal. and you can color these guys and uh, nice. a lot of fun there's uh lemmy and and everyone from motorhead uh and good stuff so good fun 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 which one would you color i'm gonna show oh man uh, I think Lemmy from Motorhead. Yeah, I, I wouldn't think you're a Motorhead guy. <laughs> <laughs> you would have fun coloring All that right, one. All right, tip time. Tip time, tip time. Okay, tip time. okay, let's go. Um, so anyway, my, my tip is usually uh, Google Maps, and this is the Google Maps app. Has There's six hidden tricks to learn today. So uh, thank you to Katie Connor at uh, CNET for this. I appreciate that. And uh, basically... Um, these are kind of interesting things. You know, there's always these little things that they add to apps that I have no clue that they added, and and you know, I need articles like this to kind of pull, pull up. So, so see where you're working into it with Live View, and uh, so basically, uh, when you park your car five blocks away from your destination, it's it's would be tricky to follow the small small blue dot. They say so. So what you could do in your Google Maps app is after you enter a destination, um, uh, and tap directions. You can select the walking icon, which is common. But on the bottom of the screen, tap the Live View button, and it's located next to the Start button. Point your camera at buildings and signs, and when you start walking towards your destination, large arrows <laughs> will be pointing. <laughs> yes, that's cool, cool. I'm gonna have wow. to, yeah, I'm gonna have to post that that that, that little video that they have on <laughs> online. So, so that's pretty cool. The next one is okay. uh, go off grid with incognito mode. So. Um, uh, feature is Android and now iPhone uh, users lets you go into incognito mode using Google Maps. I, I didn't know this. Um, so open the Google Maps app, tap wow. your profile icon at the top right hand corner and turn on incognito mode. Uh, when you're uh, ready to turn the setting off, follow the same steps and turn off incognito mode. Um, I, I kind of, uh, this next one, uh, use maps offline, I kind of knew about this, but, you know, there, uh, through the app, I wasn't quite sure how you do it now. Um, you, 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 uh, if, when you need the directions the most, your iPhone loses signal, right? So go ahead and download the maps and use it offline. So in Google Maps app, enter your des destination. At the bottom of the screen, tap the name of the place of the, or the address. Tap the three-dot menu in the right-hand corner and tap download offline map. And it'll actually say how many how many megabytes is gonna cost your phone's memory, but tap download and then you'll have the map offline. And then lastly, plan the route of your entire trip, including stops. So like let's say you're stopping by the the, the, the bakery or the the store or 
or the, the mask store to pick up new masks or whatever, you know, you could actually add a stop in your in your route and actually you can estimate how long it's going to take to get to the end destination. So anyway, um, and the last, oh, I'm sorry, lastly is find an area to park your car. So once you're in Google Maps, you tap directions, you'll see the P icon at the bottom next to, um, I think, the estimated time. Tap that, and if the P is red, meaning parking will be limited, so it may... Uh, may change your desire to go that area or maybe do it in a later part of the day if it's blue it means parking will be easy and or medium challenging so anyway hmm. we'll post those videos in yeah, there good yeah stuff yeah all right man all right all right well thanks everyone again for watching and listening out there go to nerdstalker.com nerdstalker tv on youtube and all the places give us the thumbs up uh, hit the bell and the subscribe and all the things so i am adolfo fronda at nerd stalker on twitter and greg how do we find out more about you oh uh, you could uh find me on twitter at at social greg you can see a little label at the bottom there on my bottom left hand screen or uh you could reach me at social greg at nerd and then uh you know ping me with any uh tips items or things you want us to write about we'll be happy to encourage you to do that thank you so much awesome all right thanks everyone for watching and listening and be careful out there.